Thank you. Oh my goodness. Can I just say I am so happy to see faces in front of me after two, this is the first time I've done a presentation in over two years since COVID. So I'm jacked to see all of you in front of me instead of doing a virtual thing. Are you guys sick of virtual yeah, stuff yeah. right now? So I'm super happy to be here, honored. I first wanna thank b &H, uh, and the whole crew there, David Brommer in particular for putting all of this together. Um, so if we can get a quick little round of applause for those. They, they don't get as much recognition to people behind the scenes that make a big conference like this work. So we're super excited uh, that they have uh, put this together for us. And so, so let me ask just a quick question. Who's into lighting? Everybody should have their hands up, right? Without light, you won't have a photograph. So um, we're going to talk a lot about that today. We're going to talk about speed lights and all the cool stuff that you can do with one of these. I mean, you could do a lot with just one little speed light. Uh, the, the, real, the, the limit is really your imagination. But before we get to all of that, we just made an announcement last night at 11 p.m. Did anybody catch it? There's two new cameras, uh, the R8 and the R50, that just came out along with two new lenses. Uh, these are uh, some really cool things, and we have them downstairs in the, uh, the room with uh, Canon, Sony, and Nikon, but they're at the Canon place, so just sure. FYI. Yeah, so uh, go check them out. They're really cool. We were out at an event in Charleston last week doing shooting with them, uh, with the media. It was fantastic. Uh, a lot of great content. So um, you can pre-order all this stuff, of course, on B&H's website. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. These are really uh, great cameras. They're more on the consumer end, uh, but really, like, especially the R8. I shot with it all week last week, and it's just amazing. So uh, take a look at that. So all right, on to the program. So does, who shoots with speed lights? Raise your hands, just anybody. Who is scared of speed lights? It's okay. We're all, we're all amongst friends here. It's fine. It's fine. You know, this is, it's, we're all in this together, right? So all of us are smarter than one of us. And that's one of my, my main things that, you know, like when we all get together, there's a lot of ideas that all of us share. And nobody knows it all. You're, you're, it's a constant learning battle. Uh, and once you think you've known, you know it all, then you should just check out because there's always somebody like Christy Shirk uh, that will throw mad knowledge in uh, Lightroom that she just did. Like, I didn't even know half of that stuff, but that's a whole other story. So let's get into it, okay? Um, so. First, before we get into that stuff, I just want to say, if, if you have to leave early, here's my contact information. If you want to throw your, your phone up and catch the screen, um, please reach out. Let's, let's coordinate and collaborate and anything with an eight on it, I'm in there. Let's talk about stuff online, offline. Let's get together and, and talk photography because this is what I, this is really all I know. Um, as he mentioned, this is all I know for like, this is my 35th year doing professional photography. I feel really old. And Michelle Salentano, our Canon Explorer of Light, right up here in the first row, um, she's like sister from another mister, I think. Is right. Yeah, so we were, uh, so yeah, there's so many different odd things that we're learning about each other that are parallels. We both worked on a cruise ship back in early 90s. It was, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> So anyway, there's my stuff. Uh, if you have to leave, I, please reach out. I'd love to see you online. Um, and let's get into it. So let's talk about light, right? First, we're going to go into different types of light. And then we're going to get into the gelling of speed lights, things like that. Um, gelling speed lights can be really misunderstood. And a lot of people will get confused with how do I really get these great saturated colors? Well, we're going to cover all that. I've got lighting diagrams from overhead. Uh, all kinds of great stuff that will hopefully add some insight. And ma many of you may know a lot of this stuff, and that's cool, but there probably is going to be some things that you didn't know. And if you gather little nuggets here and there, that's when you get that incremental learning that happens, and uh, then we all get smarter. Uh, if you know it all, that's cool, too. Maybe you can come up next time and teach the class. It'll be awesome. So anyway, so let's talk about it, right? Hard lighting. What's on me right now? Hard lighting. I got this spotlight, you know, like right on me. It's burning my retinas out. It's hard lighting. So I know that because when I look at the shadow, I see a very hard edge to the, to the light. So the, the, the shadow of her nose or 
uh, her chin line, anything like that, you're going to see a very hard edge shadow. You know when you're out on a sunny day and you look at your shadow on the sidewalk, it's got a very hard edge on it. So that means a very small light source like the sun. Now the sun is gigantic, right? But it's so far away, it's only that big in the sky. So uh, hard light can also work very well, but a lot of times people are afraid of it. Portrait photographers in general say, I want to shoot at the sweet light time of day. What's that? Early morning or late afternoon, right before the sun goes down? Well, if you do this for a living, you, you can't necessarily just shoot at those times of day. There's stuff in the middle of the day that you need to be able to make a living. So that's where speed lights come in. You can really do a ton with speed lights in uh, full sun on the beach, the most challenging lighting condition in the world on the beach. No, no cover, anything, but you can do a lot with a speed light. So anyway, let's get back to this. Hard light, now let's look at soft light. Soft light is just like a cloudy day. The transition between highlight and shadow is very subtle, right? We've all seen this. This is nothing groundbreaking or new, but I just want to show you some examples. Um, so it's generally more flattering, right? Especially for those that may have some texture to their skin. Um, this particular model, had, and she's not, she doesn't aware of this, uh, but she has a lot of texture in her skin. You're going to see that in the next slide. I apologize if I'm talking too fast for you online. We're, this is an East Coast thing. Um, <laughs> so I'm just warning you right now. Uh, go back and then play it at like one and a half times less, and it'll all sound like middle America. It's fine. We, we, you're all welcome, but I apologize. But there's so much content we have that... I want to make sure I get it all in. So soft light is wonderful, but it can also uh, be not so wonderful because the sh sometimes you want more contrast in your image. So has anybody heard of Rembrandt lighting before? Rembrandt, Rembrandt, Rembrandt lighting, he tried to say, is very contrasty. It doesn't mean that it's hard light. It can still be soft light, but you have that light, that light pushed so far over that you get this little triangle shape in on the cheek there, and that, that right there is where you see that Rembrandt lighting. It's usually lit a little bit high and up on one side or the other. It's just different types of light. None of them are, are better than an other. It depends on the subject. Of course, the answer to everything is it depends. Uh, when you get somebody that says, well, what's the best camera for me? Well, it depends. And people hate to get that answer, but it's true. You have to ask yourself questions. So split lighting. Uh, split lighting is, is very much from one side, so if I were to turn this way, uh, I would have split lighting on me. Now, usually with split lighting, without any other reflectors present, you're going to have one side of the face very light, one side of the face very dark. Now, you're noticing we are seeing some detail. I don't know if you can see. Okay, yeah, you can see a little bit more detail on the TV. Um, so usually from the left or the right. And then this particular image, I had a reflector on the right side so you can see that detail a little bit that comes out. But if I didn't have the reflector there, it would go almost totally black. Loop lighting, this is also known as uh, short lighting. This is one of my favorite types of lighting. Uh, you'll notice that it's uh, lit from obviously one side or the other. It's not to the degree of Rembrandt lighting, just kind of in between. Uh, and then you have this obvious little loop under the nose, but it doesn't connect to that shadow on the shadow side of the, where the cheek is, on, the, on this side, on the right. So, uh, but it's there still. And this light is generally, you're gonna see the, the cheek that's closest to the camera uh, is in shadow. That's how you know you're doing short lighting. Okay, and it's usually very flattering. It also is thinning. This is something that a lot of people ask, you know, what, those of you, who's a professional photographer in the room? A couple of, okay, a few of you, right. Does, you never get asked the question, can you take 15 pounds off, right? Nobody ever hears that, <laughs> right? We're all happy with the way we look. Um, so this is one of the ways that as a photographer or an artist that you can help reduce and make your clients, or just even if you're not doing this professionally, you can make your, your subject look thinner than they actually are. This is, this is uh, the magic of lighting. Uh, so, all right, now let's talk about broad lighting. Broad lighting is the exact opposite of what we just saw, uh, where the, the cheek that's closest to the camera, which in this case is the one on the left, her right cheek, is closest to the camera. Now, it's usually that, again, some the, from the right or the left, it's less flattering for most of us, but not everybody. If you have somebody with a really thin, narrow face, this could work really, really well for them. Again, the answer to everything is it depends. Um, it does add, it tends to add weight to your subject. So if, again, if you have somebody that's very thin, 
um, and they're a little bit concerned about it, this is a good way to kind of help them along just a with a little bit. Usually we're on the other side of that. We all want to look thinner, right? So uh, again, cheek closest to the camera is the one that has the light on it. Now, butterfly lighting. This is uh, what a lot of like, glamorous type of lighting uh, is, is uh, a lot of photographers use this. So it's lit from above, just literally right overhead, and uh, the shadow falls under the nose. It doesn't extend to the point where you get to the lip. You don't want it so high that that shadow goes into the lip line because then it becomes very distracting and it doesn't look right. So um, again, this is more glamorous style lighting. You see a lot of headshots done with butterfly lighting. And a lot of times there's either another light underneath, which is then considered a different type of lighting called clamshell lighting. Makes sense, right? You've got one up here, got one down here. Um, oftentimes you can just have a reflector underneath with one speed light or strobe, whatever you're using, and uh, just apply a little bit of a catch light. Anybody know what a catch light is? Okay, right? It's the reflections from the light source in the eyes. If you don't have a catch light in the eye, usually the eyes die and so go, goes the portrait. In a lot of cases, not always. If you want, there's always a reason to break those rules, but I think it's important to learn the rules first and then successfully break them. So reflectors can come from underneath as well. Just to kind of fill in, it's, it's really a contrast game. We want to uh, either lessen or you know, make the contrast greater for effect. And it really depends on what your vision of the portrait will be. Okay, now, on-camera flash. This is Everybody's got a different opinion on camera flash, right? So, but it, it does have a purpose. Um, oftentimes it can be very, very harsh. Remember, we're talking about a light source that's very small. The smaller the light source, the harsher that light is. But there's a lot you can do with a speed light because a lot of them have this ability to bounce. So we'll talk about that. Um, okay, moving on. So one of the cool things about speed lights is they have a zoom head where you can actually focus the cone of light that comes out of that head, which many strobes, like studio strobes, don't have that capability. So it's almost like just putting a, a, a snoot, which is like, uh, I don't have it in front. Oh, here it is. This is a, a, a different type of a snoot. And it basically just focuses the beam of light uh, into a smaller area. It can be very effective, but this is done optically through the, head, the flash head by zooming it in and out. And um, so you'll notice on this particular picture you see uh, the bulk of the light is hitting the front or the very, you know, facial area and then it drops off down as you get towards below the model's chest. That's more like a spotlight kind of thing like it's on me right now, um, but it can be very effective and also very effective off camera, so play with it. Okay, now this is, uh, this is very rudimentary. So I, I went out and I bought a $2 shower curtain, but there's, there's a lot of really cool benefits. Now we all wanna go to B&H and buy these beautiful expensive soft boxes, right? But um, this is going to give you a, a kind of an indication of what you can do with a speed light. And just take that shower curtain in this particular instance and pretend it's a, a wall, a white wall or a light colored wall. We're going to bounce off of that. Now, you can also take the flash head and zoom it in and out to create a smaller bounce area. So you're just basically, if you zoom the flash head, you're taking and you're making a smaller light source. If you zoom the flash head out to a wider beam, you're making a larger light source because it's hitting that wall. And whatever that's hit, whatever's hitting the wall, is that's your size of your light source, which is going to then determine how soft that light is hitting the subject. And I have some examples to show you. So this is um, just white shower curtain and we're bouncing the flash off of that. It's a fairly uh, soft uh, light hitting our subject because uh, it's hitting a large area of white. So you could make that a wall or whatever you want. This is with no reflector on the side. Now you're gonna notice subtle differences, but I want you to pay attention in particular to the, the hair on her right side when we add the reflector. It just lightens it up a little bit. It's subtle. Can you guys see that? Okay, great. So very subtle, but if you want to have a little more contrast, just take the reflector out. If you want less contrast, bring it in. Now, uh, narrow beam. So what we did here was we zoomed the flash out to 200 millimeters uh, on the um, EL1 flash from Canon. And you're noticing it's hitting a smaller area within that shower curtain or wall. And now we have, again, a smaller light source, even though it's relatively pretty big, about the same size as some of the soft boxes that are out there. And you can see uh, on this example here, you're gonna see uh, a smaller light source or bounce on the left side. And on the right side, we have a larger light source. So the one on the right is with a wide beam of light hitting the, the shower curtain. And on the left is the 
uh, larger or the shorter zoomed in head. Make sense? You can see the difference between them. It did soften her features. So, uh, and, and so I always say, and, and Michelle and I were talking about this the other day, one of our other uh, former Canon Explorers of Light has this expression and it goes like this, beauty is in the eye of the checkbook holder. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it depends on, you know, what, whatever the market will bear, whatever they're willing to pay for you to, to make it. And so if this one of these is more flattering than the other to the one who's paying for it, um, that's all that matters. It really, you know, that's why you do a lot of different things, uh, but it also helps to hone your skills and just kind of know ahead of time what your subject's perhaps fears are before you photograph them so that you can then take steps to do what, what we do best and make them look their best. So pretty simple, right? So off-camera flash. This is the, one of the basis. When you get the, can the flash off the camera, now you can really start sculpting the light, OK? Uh, so we, we have to think about this, all right? So we have to set up a transmitter. Um, and that's, I don't have it in front of me, but we have a, a transmitter that just mounts on the hot shoe, and that controls the off-camera flash. Now, when Canon first came out with its radio-based off-camera uh, transmitter, it was in 2012, and nobody else had it at that point. So it was like amazing not have to worry about light transmission being like line of sight. You have to see it. You could start hiding flashes in areas and have that just pop automatically, and it was great. We loved it. And then it exploded after that. So decide how we want the portrait to look. Uh, do we want harsh light? Do we want soft light? Somewhere in between? The answers are, are limitless, really. Uh, there's so many options um, to choose from, but again, this comes with having a little bit of uh, scouting, if you will, of what your subject is really after. And maybe they don't know, and they're leaning on you. Well, you're the photographer, you just take the picture. Okay, well, we could do that. So you, you have to look at your subject and, and study them a little bit and figure out what's going to be, based on your experience, what's going to be best for them. So think about um, you know, the use of reflectors, um, just filling in shadows. Do you want that? Do you not want that? And if you're not sure, do it all and then see what it looks like later in post. So there's lots of options. So one of the harshest ones, right, is just taking the flash right off camera, putting it on a light stand and aiming at our subject. And that's pretty harsh, right? Um, so you could tell it's hard lighting by looking at the hard edge shadow uh, on, on her neck. Uh, and it's not exactly the most flattering, but if you have a situation where you uh, have a color image, a lot of times if you have harsh lighting like this, just make it black and white and all of a sudden it kind of looks better. So don't be afraid of that, just black and white. You never know. I always say when somebody complains about digital noise, if you ran high ISO really up the ramp, um, just make it black and white and now it's art. Okay? <laughs> so it works. Try it. Okay, so back to the, the, the shower curtain. Now we've taken the light and we've got it off camera. You notice on the camera there's a transmitter. And we've taken the flash and we've put it on the other side. So we've got this transmissive uh, light going through the, the, uh, the shower curtain now. And you'll notice that the, uh, the size of this light is fairly small uh, on the shower curtain. You can kind of see that circle there of light that's, that's there. This is zoomed to 200 millimeters. So we have a fairly small light source overall. But what, what I want you to pay attention to, this is interesting, because again, remember I said, you can do a lot with one light. Uh, so right now, we've got beautiful light on her. Uh, but what's happening to the background? Okay, uh, we've got, especially when you're working with a light background or a white background, the further you get away from that background, the darker that white will go. It'll be a gray, some form of gray, until you get so far back, it goes black. Uh, that's because there's no light striking it. So think of your scene in layers and how that light is playing. So you're going to paint it. You're going to have a layer where your, your subject is. You have a layer where your background is. You have a layer where your foreground is. And I mean, just it could be limitless. So you'll notice in this particular picture here with one speed light, and we're about mm, five or six feet away from the paper uh, on the background, the, that background's going gray. And that may be what you want, and that's fine. But if you want that pure white, you have to find a way to get light on it, whether it be with one other speed light hitting the background or there's another way. And this is the only way you can do this 
with the shower curtain is you can get that background pure white and still have beautiful light on your subject. And how did we do that? Uh, so again, you'll see this is gray. Now, here's the deal. What I did was I widened the beam of light. So you'll notice now that the, the whole shower curtain is illuminated. But notice the shadow on the ground from the shower curtain down beneath her chair. There's a little shadow diagonal line there. That light is now, the, the hard light is striking the background, which is about a stop and a half to two stops brighter than what's hitting the subject. So you've created, you've, can I say kill the bird, two birds with one stone? Can I say that? Okay. I love birds, but don't kill the birds, but you get the expression, right? So, but this is cool. So now we've got uh, wide 20 millimeters on that, and the light source on her is super soft. It is fantastic looking. So um, when we show this now, okay, that light's still pretty far away from the background, but now we've got a pure white background with only one light. So it's, it's always good to carry a shower curtain around. That's the, <laughs> that's the bottom line. So. Uh, it, it, it just works. So you have, to, you, you have a challenge and you have to find the solution. You had a quick question. I want to take questions at the end, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to allow it. <laughs> so, be, so the question was, is it towards the background? No, it's actually aimed at the shower curtain, but because I widened the beam of light, there's, there's light that's passing beyond to the far side of that that's hitting the background. And that's how that was achieved. It's just, you know. How did I whiten it? Widen. So on the flash, there, you can zoom the flash head. So, and a lot of times your flashes are set, you have an auto setting, which if you have a zoom lens, as you zoom the lens, it'll automatically zoom based on what focal length you're at. But you can manually override that and zoom it in and out yourself, which is nice. And that's how this was done. Um, now, the next thing, and this is when we start adding grids. A grid is nothing more than, like when you cross the street and there's the do not walk sign, right? They have a grid on that, so somebody else doesn't see it from another angle. You know, okay, if you can see it, it's for you, right? So that's what a grid does. It, it basically focuses the light into a particular area. It can still be soft. It's not necessarily uh, making the light harder, but it, it's just concentrating it into a certain area that you want it to be. And that's nothing more than what a grid does. Um, but this is where gels really, really come into play. And you'll see this as we, as we move on. Um, so you can see now that that white background is getting pretty dark. It's not black, but if I were to pull everything back, the more I do that, the darker or blacker that background will get. Now, this is where, like I said, really important where gels come in. You have to, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you have to keep in mind that when you want to add a gel, you have to have no white light, which means from the flash, we're considering that white light, and I'll go, I'll go over that in a minute. Uh, you can't have any of that light or minimal light striking the area that you're gelling. Okay, so there's a look at grids. And the grids are available for a lot of different soft boxes. Unfortunately, they don't work on an umbrella because umbrellas just throw a massive amount of light forward. That's all they're doing. There's no control there. Uh, so it's very difficult to gel when you're using an umbrella. Okay, so we create shadows by taking the, the flash off camera. We create dimension by uh, adding separation lights. What I say separation light, uh, it's also known as a hair light. It's also known as a kicker. Um, those are different terms for the same thing. Okay, and we create, um, we control shadow density, or in other words, how deep those shadows are by lighting ratios uh, or reflector fill. Okay, um, so let's look at some two light portrait examples, then we're gonna go all the way up to like five lights and then we're gonna get into gelling. So this is very simple. Um, you can't get much more simple than this. You have one light on uh, one side of the model, a reflector on the other, and uh, rather than have just one light like we just ex uh, I just showed you, you have another speed light on the background independently, so there's two speed lights in this. That's lighting the background, and generally on a white background, you wanna go about a stop and a half to two stops over what is on your subject to make that pure white, okay? So when you see uh, this uh, speed light aimed at background for clean white tone, plus two FEC, flash exposure compensation, that's just making it two F-stops brighter than what's on your subject, that's what that means. And you can do that, what's cool, you can do that right from your transmitter. 
on the Canon. It's the STE3RT. They also have the STE10, which then you would actually, it's just a smaller transmitter and it fits right on top of the hot shoe and then you can do everything from the screen. Just push like you do on your phone. Pretty cool. Okay, so um, you'll notice that uh, we've added a grid on this and the grid helps keep that light off of the background. That's all the point uh, of a grid would be. Control, okay? And then so this one, um, rather than have the light off to one side or the, back, uh, or the other in the back, we've added a boom and it's just like literally almost right over and slightly behind her head to give you a nice soft uh, flash uh, separation and you see the hair light on her. And when you have a model that has dark hair, you have to add a little bit more because that dark hair chews up a little bit more light than perhaps somebody that's got blonde hair or white hair or gray hair. So just be mindful of that. Okay, pretty simple. Um, one, it's, you know, very basic portrait here. Now, when you get into um, some other things, we, so more low key or darker portraits, um, this is just a black background, right? And then I added a small speed light just on that background. Do so you see that little gray area right through her arm there into the, the left of her, of her left eye or her right eye? Um, that's just adding a little bit of dimension in there so it, I didn't lose, we need to see where that hair was. So that's why I added that in there. Now, again, now we're starting to get into a little bit of gels and this is kind of fun. This is butterfly lighting here on her, uh, just light right overhead on about a 45 degree angle back toward camera and then a reflector underneath and that was uh, gridded and then we added this red gel gridded on the background for that little spot and then it fades off to black. Um, you can do, one thing about gels that I'll mention is uh, either a black background or a gray background. Those really play nicely with gels. Um, when you start trying to gel a white background, it's like you ever mix paints? Like if we mixed uh, red paint with white paint, what do you get? You get pink. Same thing with backgrounds. So this is also where you're going to see when we start mixing um, light coming out of with a non-gelled light with a gelled light, and if you mix them, you get a subtle mix of that, which doesn't, in a lot of cases, go good. So the gel goes, so, okay, I have this little question was, where do I put the gel? They, there's lots of different gel options out there. There's, you can buy sheets of them from Roscoe, which B&H carries. Uh, there's also a company called MagMod, M-A-G-M-O-D, and they have these cool things that you just, uh, you mount on the flash, and pretty cool, we'll drop my water, but they have this little, magnetic mount here and it just sticks. It's like super easy, I love it, and uh, it makes working very, very fast. And when you're working especially with a model that's either short on time or short on attention span, um, you need to work quickly. <laughs> so that's pretty uh, simple. And then there's a simple, simple reflector underneath. Uh, one thing I, I, will, I will say, there's a lot of material, and I'm gonna take questions, I'll write them down. I want to take all the questions at the end if we have time, and then not, I will be back here uh, afterwards to answer all your questions. So just jot them down if you wouldn't mind, because there's a lot of info that I have to get to. Okay, so now, two light portrait again. This one's fairly simple. Um, whether you like it or you don't like it, that's for you to decide. Uh, this one's pretty simple. I used a very hard uh, bare flash to the left of the model, and then I had a umbrella light right over camera to fill in the shadows. That's controlling the contrast. So the umbrella would be the, um, the fill light, just bringing the shadow level up a little bit, and then that hard light from the left is that kind of like spotlight on the subject. It's just a different, different type of light, and that's all. Pretty simple. And then you can get really you know, funky and, and uh, dramatic by, you know, if you have this muscle guy, right, and you wanna just make something really cool with gels and have no white light, you can add, you know, a, a one gel on one side, one on the other, and create some drama. Really simple, two light, just like that. And this is very, uh, just bare bulb kind of light, just no modifiers at all, right on the subject. And then so, in this particular example, this was in uh, St. Louis at a conference we did, um, a grid on the light that's coming from the left, striking the model. Again, if I didn't have that grid, that light, that white light from the, from the main light is going to strike that background and then spoil the color from that red. There's a little speed light uh, on a, with a little foot just aimed right at the, at the uh, porcelain, I don't know if that's porcelain, some sort of textile on the wall. Uh, but it gelled really well. So we worked with it. 
Now, you can get really, really focused with some of your light. Again, we put a, a blue gel on the background, and we use this. This is MagMod. This is called the uh, MagSphere. And this, this, um, this really, it just gives a nice, subtle, round uh, highlight on the background, then it fades off nicely. So it's a nice diffusion that way. But if I were to put the speed light directly on the background, you'd see a harder edge to uh, that, and it, it's just not as it, it doesn't work as well. Um, that, so this was called the, um, the mag beam, the, the light that's on her face, and we used a CTO, or a color temperature orange gel, which are color correction gels, but you can use them for a lot of other things. Uh, and you could really focus the light on uh, your subject by creating, uh, they have these little things called cookies, and they go in uh, to the thing, and you, it basically it's a pattern, and it just projects this pattern onto your subject. It's kind of cool. So you can create all kinds of mood, and this is what we do. We have to create the mood for whatever it is that we're trying to convey to uh, the, our viewers, okay? Now, three lights. Let's go in. So again, decide how you want the portrait. Harsh, soft. Again, you ask the same questions. Do we want to use gels? Is the model or subject wearing something that we can accent with a gel? If not, no big deal. Don't use it. Uh, these are all questions you have to ask yourselves. Uh, in the Canon system, we can use up to 15 speed lights at the same time. That's a lot of money in speed lights, I understand, um, in up to five different groups. And different groups meaning you can control each of those groups independently right from camera. Okay, so you can control the brightness of every one of those groups, uh, which is really a nice thing to be able to do without having to go back to each light and set it individually. You can do it right from camera and you save tons of tons of time. Okay, uh, and you can also mix uh, ETTL, which is auto, Canon speak for automatic flash. You can mix that with manual flash. And just either way, it's, it's fun. So if you have one flash that you need manual because uh, you really want to blast a lot of, of light through it, and you tried doing the flash exposure compensation, it goes plus or minus three. But if you need more than that, you can absolutely just write, override it to manual and punch more or less light through it to taste. Quick question. In those five groups, if you have three lights in each group, can you individual each light in the five groups? So, quest so question is, in, in each individual group, you didn't pay attention to my ask questions later, Michelle. Shame on you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so it, the question... That's okay. The question was, can you each, in each individual group, can you control the power of each of those individually within the group, or do they all have to be the same? If, like, say, for instance, in our B group, we have three flashes in the B group. Um, yes, so they will all have to be individually set. In, in the B group, it's saying, okay, you have them set for this, and they all have to be the same. Now, what you could do if you really wanted to get fancy with it, is you could get neutral density filters and put them right over top of the flash if you needed that kind of really specific control, okay? And then make it happen. So um, three light portraits, right? So now we have a light coming from the, the main light coming from the left, a kicker coming from behind, uh, and you'll see that by just looking at the, her arm that's kind of angled there. You can see a highlight on that arm which helps separate it from the background, and then a light that goes right onto the background. That's pretty simple, okay? Um, Let's see, yeah, there's the kicker, and there's your, and that, that's gridded too, because I, I liked having, so I used the mag sphere with a grid in it, so you create a little bit of a, a tighter uh, highlight on the background. There's no reflector on this one, and you know that because those shadows on the shadow side of her face are pretty deep. And so one thing you can do is you can put a reflector there, which will also help create a, a barrier for that kicker light so you're not flaring out your lens. So if you put the, the reflector uh, block, which would be right here, uh, that would help block the light from striking the lens. And this is another reason why you want to use grids for your kickers that come from behind so that you're not flaring out your lens. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so another three light example. This is again pretty simple. We have same basic lighting setup as that last one we had. Um, Except you've got grids here. You've got a main light with a grid. You've got your kicker with a grid. Again, now we're using a gel on this one, and we want to control that light we don't, light spill. You don't want any of that light hitting the background. And that's where uh, specific control really comes into play when using grids, uh, with gels, excuse me. And this one, we have a reflector on there because we just had that nice, uh, sh subtle shadow on, on the side of her face. So grids are key when we're talking about gels, if I haven't made that clear yet. <laughs> 
Okay, this one was kind of cool. This was uh, in a hotel in St. Louis. Um, they had this old elevator shaft, and that's what that, that wrought iron behind her is. And so here's the setup. We had um, one main light which had bl a blue gel in it, and that's creating this. So we're gonna build this. So she looks like a Smurf here, but we're building it. Okay, work with me. All right, and then that, so we've got that light there. The next thing we've got, we added, was the, the blue light in the background, and of course that light that's lighting or illuminating her face. But we were able to take the blue light uh, on, a, on, a, on a big light stand and put it into the elevator shaft to eliminate that whole elevator shaft behind her, because uh, it was open up top, like eight foot above. And so that was kind of a nice little bonus. Uh, and then what we did on, on the uh, subject face was we added a snoot, in fact, this very snoot, to focus that beam of light right on her face so her body still remains blue, but her face becomes reality, right? So what we did on there, you'll notice there's a little grid on there, or a gel. We used a CTO, color temperature orange, and that was a, um, a half CTO. CTOs come in full, half, and quarter, to my knowledge. There may be tighter versions available, but those are the ones that, that I've seen. Uh, so a half CTO is, um, it looks like a warming filter, okay? And basically, this is canceling out that blue light that you saw from this picture, and we've concentrated it on her face, and so you, don't, you no longer see that blue light uh, that we had in the first picture. And what's the opposite of blue? Yellow. So we're canceling that light out. And so it's a very nice, dramatic portrait. You've got this great, deep, saturated colors, and then boom, you go right to her face. Your eye goes to two main areas when you look at a photograph, the area of greatest uh, contrast and the area of sharpest focus. So you're directing the viewer's eye where you want it to go by lighting. Now, here's another one, same building. Um, they had this baby grand piano there, and I, I, there's a friend of mine, and we decided, I said, I want to do this portrait because she had this, it was a little party night, and she had this little 50s style or whatever uh, outfit on which was kind of cute, and so here's what we did. We took a main light and there was not, no uh, gel on it. We just aimed it right at her face. Uh, I wanted to be very specific on this. This is five lights you're gonna see. Uh, so when I, aimed, when I had the light on her face, her, her arms were going dark and it really looked like it was just a floating face. So then I put more grids uh, on the arms so you could, you could define the arms. And we're just like, it's like painting. So all we're doing, and then the next thing here is I put this blue gel on the mag beam, and I put a little a cookie in there that was basically looked like, um, like a Venetian blind thing. You'll see it in, in one of the next pictures. Um, and then I added the uh, separation light, which you see from the hair and down her arm, which separates her from the background. And then lastly, I added a, gru uh, a blue gridded gel and bounced it off of the top of the black of the, uh, of the underside of the piano. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not gonna get any bounce from that, but guess what? It did, and it hits down in there. So not only did we get the bounce, the blue up in, on the top there, but it then reflected down into where all of the piano um, uh, wires were, the, where the notes come out. <laughs> so kind of cool. You can see the, the, uh, the gel sitting there, the speed light sitting there with the, with the mag uh, uh, gel sitting right on top of it, so that, that was kind of fun. And then so sometimes you just want to keep it simple. Um, this is a, a portrait in Tennessee at uh, the Opryland Hotel, and we, we just wanted to something just a little, add a little punch. Boom, a red gel right on the background, and all of a sudden it has a whole much better appeal, in my opinion, than the first one. Very simple. Eric, real, real quick, these are all shot with speed lights? These are all shot with speed lights. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to the meat and potatoes of how to work with gels effectively. So we already talked a little bit about when you mix your paints, right, that you get a subdued saturation from that gel, specifically with real rich colors, blues, reds, greens, things like that. Uh, and you can see it right here. This is, a, a, this is the, the same scene you see with the model on the right there, but you, I pulled her away and you can see the setup here. There's her chair and you see the light behind her and it's red, but the lights were angled more toward the background, so you get this very kind of blasé look out of it. So all we have to do is um, we add grids to our lights up front, so none of that light strikes the background, 
And now, uh, so there's your grid. And then now with the grids, two, we have two lights on, the, on either side, you can see, and then the hair light from directly behind, with, that's gridded as well. And now you get this rich red color because none of that white light is striking the background. And that's as simple as it is with working with gels. Just kind of, again, think about it in layers. Separate those individual slices, if you will, and make sure that they don't interact with each other. Okay, but from camera position, it all comes together. Okay, now we're going outside. This is awful, right? This is what street lights look like. That just nasty, I don't know if they're mercury vapor or sodium vapor, whatever they are, they're, they're horrible looking, right? So this is done in a, you know, a, a daylight balance. Uh, this is what it looks like, daylight balance. This is awful. So now we have to start building it, right? So now we add a blue gel. So let's see what happens. We turned everything off uh, other than the one blue gel, and we're starting to build here. There's our blue gel. Now, we added flash from the left. What happened? We're mixing our colors. Can't have that. So it washes that color away. Should have remembered, right? So let's move the light to the other side. Now, I didn't have grids with me in this particular case. Sometimes. Stuff happens and you forget stuff. So in order to work with the colors, you just have to push the light off far enough and, and we call it feathering it, where you're just tweaking it so it's shaded away from the area you're gelling. Okay, and that's really the, you know, without having grids, that's how you would do it. It's a little more challenging to work with because you have a little more spill, but that's kind of how you do it. So, uh, so now we cut the power down. So now we've got light on our model that's not overpowered, it looks nice. Uh, we're happy with that. Then we added a separation light, and right now we just nuked her. Um, she's completely, like, we blew the light out. So, but this is our starting point. So once we add a light, we start at a given number, and this is kind of what it was. Uh, too bright, obviously. So now we have to fix that. And you'll notice that over here on the right, we're also, it's that light that's coming from the back left is striking some of the background, and we're losing that color. So we have to be aware of that. And I changed that in the end, which you will see. So we cut the power down, and now we have a nice separation. You can see the, the highlight on her hair, on her neckline. It's much more flattering. Now we decided to add a spotlight right on her face. And again, same problem, right? Now we've got this horrible shadow behind her, and we nuked her again with the light. So we've got to obviously bring that way down. Uh, and it's on the wrong side. So again, we have to work with pulling the light to the other side and making sure the shadow falls off where we don't really see it and we're not uh, mixing our colors again. So there's the problem. Now, uh, we've moved to the light to the other side. We reduced the power, but not enough. So we have to go down a little more. And there's your final shot. It's just adjusting the power to taste. But what we also did was th that light from the, the kicker coming from the back was a little distracting. Uh, so I just wanted a little kiss of light and I put the light directly behind the model. So I illuminated just a little pin light uh, around her. Uh, you'll see it on, from the hair on the very top of her head. So that, that was that. Um, so that's all we did. So here's a, a, an overhead view of the lighting scheme. Okay, we've got the main light off to the right. We've got the snooted light, which was again this right here. Uh, that was the beam on her face. And then we had a backlight right behind her and then the blue gel from behind. Now what I also did was sometimes a model would be wearing a color that is just hard to match with the gels you have. If you have a whole stack of Roscoe gels, you can pretty much match them, but the MagMod doesn't have the full scope of what Roscoe has. So what I had to do was I just took the eyedropper in Photoshop, I clicked on her dress to get a color, and then I painted with color just to kind of match what's in the background that kind of matches with her dress. It's a little cheating, but if you just were here for Christy Shirk's program, my friend Carl's in the back there, he says, nothing's real anymore. I don't even know what to believe. So, but that's the world we live in now, and it's, it's fine. It's all in the interest of art, right? Now, here's another one. Uh, this is on a set of steps. And where I started with this was not where I wanted, where I had anticipated I would end. And so we've got some problems here. The first, we, we just turned on the, uh, the main key light, which was off to the right side of the uh, camera. And then we added a hair light or separation light from up at the top of the steps 
angling right toward the back. And you can see her hair is illuminated and separated very, very well. Um, but we had this weird shadow when I added a red gel in from the left side to see the shadow from the railing, uh, which kind of bothered me. And then also we, we were getting some just like s the spoil from the color uh, with the white light coming from the right side. So I, I tried moving that off to the right more so that it wasn't striking the steps and flaring back, um, which cut down the glare. But I still have that weird shadow. I didn't like it. So we, we, you, know, you, you find the problem and you work the problem. So we added a snoot first uh, to her already fair skin, but obviously we have to bring that down. So we just focused in on that group, dialed the power down, uh, and we ended up with this. This is the final image. And I have a, an overhead scheme, thank you. Uh, we had an overhead scheme from that. So basically she's surrounded in red gel. So you have a red gel in the main light, you have red gels on the top angling down, one red gel that's illuminating the behind her with the steps and you end up with what you see here. Um, so you just have to work the problem until, and this is when I, what I teach, this is exactly how I do it. I build it so that you see the problems that I'm going through and you know how to deal with them and you just work it until you figure it all out. And that's, that's really it. So this one's kind of cool. We did this at Depth of Field a couple of years ago. This model was amazing. Um, this is butterfly light, light right over camera. Obviously the power needs to come down. Um, and so we brought the power down. This is a starting point. We adjusted for the skin tone, brought the power down. And then we turned that off and we went to go figure out, okay, now the, the separation lights. I've got two gridded lights coming from behind at 45 degree angles to the subject. And that's a little too bright, so then we just toned them down. We only want a little kiss of light coming from those. Now, be careful. When you add separation lights and they're coming back to the camera, uh, they're going to appear twice as light, twice as bright, at the same, so if you were to add the same power uh, that you have coming forward, the lights that are behind are gonna be, look twice as bright because of a rule called the angle of incidence. Um, so you have to dial those way down uh, to taste. And this is what's cool about digital is you see it right in front of you and you go, okay, I gotta turn it down. Um, so then we're trying to find a right, the right color. So going through my gels, uh, I had a green gel. That obviously didn't work well enough so then I added a green gel and a blue gel together and I came up with this color, but obviously it's not a real good match. We have to tone that down. The more power you put through your speed light or your, your strobe or whatever, um, the, again, we're mixing white light with a gel. The more power you put through there, the lighter that color is going to become. The less power you put, the deeper that color will get. So just do a little test at home. So go, run through the whole power uh, shoot it at a wall and run through the power settings and you'll see that color change and you just adjust it to match. So the, the brighter, the, the gentleman asked uh, to repeat that. So basically the more power you run, if you run full power, it's going to make that color brighter. The less, the, as you lower the power, that color is going to become deeper and more saturated. Okay? But just run through the, like run through full power and just go down the list and you'll see each shot that that light will become less and less. Now here's the final image. Now what we added here was, I, I, I was missing something from below. So this was kind of clamshell lighting like we talked about a little earlier. I added a, a strip light from Westcott. It's just a one by three strip box. It's like this by that. And there was a grid on that and I angled it up toward her face but I tipped it a little bit up uh, so it wasn't striking her chest as much but that illuminated her face brighter than her body, which again, I'm telling the viewer where I want them to look by the lighting. Your eye goes to two places. What are they? Contrast and focus. So you have so much control uh, with this and it's, it's great. So here's the lighting diagram, okay? Uh, that light on the bottom there is that strip that's coming from low and, sh and angling right up. But, but it also adds a beautiful catch light to her eyes, uh, which works out really, really well. Now, another, here's another one. This one's fairly simple. Um, she's wearing this like kind of blue jacket uh, sweater. It looked kind of cool. Same butterfly lighting as the last time. Um, but now, when you start adding separation lights, you have to be careful of hair. Now you can go in and, and retouch all this stuff, but that's a nightmare. Um, you know, if you can control it, you know, you just 
Oh, like, and you, no, I'm kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> Models don't like that. I'm kidding. Let me repeat. Don't do that to your model. Uh, let her do it. But, uh, but, you know, the other thing is we're seeing it brighter now because the, the, the hair light there is obviously too bright. So if we take the brightness down, now it's subtle. A little, just a little bit will go a long way. We, she's separated because when she, remember, if we have a, a model with dark hair, that's going to blend in if you have a dark background. So somehow you have to separate those two. All right? So the other thing that bothered me was this little bit of light from my kicker on the back was striking her cheek, and I didn't like that, so all, all we had to do was ask her to move her hair forward a little bit, and now you have nice separation there, and it's not striking her cheek anymore. Um, these are little subtle details that are, are sometimes missed, and you try to fix them in Photoshop, and sometimes it looks great, other times, you know, it's so much better to get it right in the camera as best you can. I, I, it drives me nuts. For everything that's great about Photoshop and Lightroom, you can really improve your skills if you pay attention to what's happening in front of you and get it as best you possibly can in camera. So then we added a gel, trying to match that blue color that's in her, in her uh, jacket there. But obviously that was too much. Here's the final image, you just dial the power down and all of a sudden that color gets deeper and boom, there's the final image. There's the, the lighting setup right there. Um, again, pretty simple stuff, but separation lights really make a huge difference. Now, this one was kind of fun. This was in St. Louis, again, at another conference. This is part of the hotel here, and I love these little, these holes in the, 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 the stonework. So I had one of my students just fill them with speed lights. I, <laughs> I brought a ton of speed lights for this one. So this, this shot here, let me go back. This shot here was, was done at a much higher ISO, so you can kind of see the scene, but we don't want to see that light, those street lights infused into the portrait. So we got to lower the ISO, cut it down to 100, and raise the shutter speed up to 200 of a second. So we have a black uh, area, and now we've, we've painted the lights in each one of those, those um, indentations in the stonework. Now, we're going to add the model. We shut all the lights off in the background. We're working with the model now. So we, we, we have to add a hair light to separate her from the background. Obviously, that's too hot. We tone that down to taste. That's subtle enough, we like it, so it's just dialing down each group. Very, very simple to do. And then the final image, we used 11 speed lights. You've got nine, of course, in, in the, uh, but we have the power, we could do it. So we just put gels in every speed light and kind of made it nice, and then uh, there's our final image. Um, and then we added a little bit uh, extra. We tried putting a gel in the hair light. We have a little green highlight on top of her hair, and then I kind of like this one the best. We added red, and that one to me, um, because I was the checkbook holder, that was um, appreciative uh, for me because I like, I like that. So, all right, now, one thing about, you heard me mention CTO, color temperature orange gels. Um, this is kind of cool to take a very blase lighting, cloudy, or like very much dim uh, blue hour type of image uh, and add a CTO gel and now all of a sudden we put it in the mag beam where, um, where we've got this hard light hitting her and it looks like low angle sunlight. And all of that was speed lights, no sun at all. Okay, this one here was out in, uh, outside Vegas in a town called Nelson, Nevada. There's like this ghost town out there, it's pretty cool. Um, and all we did here was add a full CTO to this and we take our, our color temperature or our white balance down to tungsten, and all of a sudden you see this blue sky. Now I have a video of this real quick that I'm gonna show you. Uh, hey, it's Eric Stoner from Canon Live Learning, and we're here in Nelson, Nevada at the Ghost Town. All right, so what we're gonna do, this is a quick tip on using CTO, or color temperature orange gel, in a flash. You know, we're kind of at dusk right now, and I want this to look kind of really moody and almost like it was shot at night. We're outside, we are in a daylight balanced environment, We've got a CTO gel on the flash here, and I'm taking my white balance down to tungsten, which is 3200 Kelvin. So what this is gonna do, is gonna make the sky completely blue in the background, giving you that appearance of kind of a nighttime look before we actually get to nighttime. So right now I've got exposure simulation turned on, which is giving me a fairly decent idea of what this is gonna look like. I'm at 200th of a second right here, as you can see. And, okay, Sean, here we go, ready? Boom. Looks really cool. So that's it. So we've got the nice warm colors in front here. The background is underexposed. 
So we've got all the detail up here in the background from those clouds, and then we've got great exposure on her, and we didn't even have to use high-speed sync. If you look here, we're at 200th of a second at f5.6, 400 ISO. <gasps> wow! So. I did not even... Wow! That's stunning. You guys have a vision. CTO gels can be your friend, not only in a color correction environment, we use it a little differently here. When you take a tungsten white balance outside, you get a blue hue from the background. Those two things in combination make it look like nighttime. It's kind of cool. So, thank you. So, one last thing here. Um, there, you, I don't want to take this too crazy, but there's uh, anybody ever hear a term called high speed sync? All right, this is one of the most misunderstood things, and I'm not going to go into it in this class, but I'm just going to share with you some of the differences here. Most, most um, photographers will accept this as normal, except for her shirt. I love it. Some, someone like you, but not quite you. <laughs> I love it. Um, so this is what a lot of people would get with flash, and, just, and then background goes completely white. It's, this is a matter of shutter speed. So all we do is turn high speed sync on. So normally uh, uh, every camera has a max sync speed and it's usually around 1 200th of a second or 1 250th. Uh, well, at those shutter speeds, you're oftentimes gonna get a white background from the sky. You don't have control of that. So we turn high speed sync on and all of a sudden, now you can control shutter speed. You drop that, sh uh, you bring the shutter speed way up and you're exposing for the bright background there and you've controlled the light locally with your, your flash on your subject. It has to be fairly close to your subject, but this is what you can get. And so that's high speed sync in a real nutshell. But there's lots of tutorials out there on, on the YouTubes of the world and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, again, uh, thank you so much. This is my contact information here. Um, and my, uh, this is generally my, my Instagram page, uh, but I'll, I'll throw this out there so you can kind of do the, the thing. Uh, but listen, I, I, I love that you were all here and we're out and we're learning in the wild again. This is great. Thank you so much for coming. My name's Eric Stoner. Thanks for coming. All right.